Hi, everyone. I'm Yi Wen from Nitro Labs. It's really great to be here, and I hope everyone's having a great second day of scale. So today, I'll be talking about some of the work that we did and published a few months back earlier in the year, end of last year. Uh, and it's about proving Solana transactions, or zk fying the BPF interpreter. All right. So the first question you may ask is, why prove SVM transactions? Well, this is how you can secure complex or computationally expensive off-chain compute. Um, the most obvious application is in the context of an SVM rollup. So traditionally, optimistic rollups have a fraud-proof mechanism where there's a sequencer and a challenger. And if the challenger thinks the sequencer is being malicious, then they issue, uh, they start a dispute, and then they go back and forth um, in an interactive bisection game until they isolate down to the one transaction that they uh, they want run on chain, and then that is run on chain, and the result of that determines who is slashed, the sequencer or the challenger. But because of this back and forth process, this is why traditionally challenge windows have been seven days or a week, which is quite long. However, if you replace that process with a, s a simple single ZK proof, then you can shorten that down from seven days to just a few hours or even less. And then Beyond that, um, beyond rollups, you can actually use uh, zk SVMs for any type of any type of computation. Um, so anything that's too complex or that you want to keep an aspect of be private, you can generate a zk proof over those SVM transactions, and then send the proof on chain, verify it on chain via an on chain verifier, and then on successful verification of that proof you can actually trigger additional actions on chain. So it's as if the original computation happened on chain when it did not. Cool. So taking a quick step back, I want to contextualize the ZK SVM work in the context of the broader work that we at Nitro are doing for our Termina platform. So our goal is to create building blocks for scaling on Solana. So if your app is running into scaling limits with execution or data or throughput, we want to help you scale without creating a separate network like um, traditional rollups or app chains. So we have three main network extension modules uh, that you can see. Today, I'll be diving into the ZK SVM, but we actually have two other modules um, to help scale your app as well. So one is the SVM engine. This lets you run SVM. This lets you have a dedicated SVM engine instance if you need to offload uh, compute in periods of congestion or a lot of contention. And then our other module is the data anchor, and this lets you put a lot of, uh, a lot of data on chain at a fraction of the cost. All right, so let's go into the ZK SVM and uh, take a look under the hood. So we knew since the beginning that we didn't want to create custom circuits. We didn't want to roll our own ZK circuits for doing this because that's super time intensive and our team is not a, a team of cryptographers. So we knew we wanted to build this on top of an existing general purpose ZK VM. We ended up going with uh, SP1 from Succinct due to its performance benefits and also ease of use. However, it wasn't as simple as dragging and dropping an anchor program into the ZKVM, uh, even though it supports general purpose Rust. Because when you write an anchor contract, you compile it to bytecode, and then you deploy that bytecode on chain. So nobody is deploying their raw anchor or Rust contracts. So we actually needed to run Agave and specifically the BPF interpreter inside uh, SP1 and prove over that instead of proving over just the, just the anchor um, programs. However, we ran into several issues with that as well. Um, so several unexpected issues. So I've bucketed them into three main categories. One is uh, Agave's use of randomness and time. 
two is its use of threads and file system access. And then the last one, which we spent the most time on, is bit depth discrepancy. So 32 bits versus 64 bits. Uh, for randomness and time, Agave uses get random uh, and also uh, time, specifically uh, the instant and duration structs, I believe. So in a ZKVM, everything needs to be determ deterministic. So we had to eliminate all these sources of non-determinism. When you use get random, it causes randomness. And so we actually had to replace Agave's uh, use of get random with SP1's own custom implementation, which is a rep repeatable pseudo-random number generator. Uh, and then for a time as well, um, we stubbed that out with just dummy implementation. So it wasn't actually calling uh, time.instant or time.now. And you may be wondering, well, agave needs to be deterministic as well for the whole validator set to reach a quorum. Uh, it's actually using randomness uh, for local salts and uh, things that are outside of the consensus critical logic just to prevent different types of attacks. Like if, uh, if one validator is vulnerable to something, then other validators kind of have a a small defense against that. And then for its use of time, it was only using it to track metrics, like performance metrics of how fast a validator is executing this piece of code or that piece of code. Um, yeah, and then the second bullet I have here is just a small implementation detail, but because Agave relies on an older version of get random, we actually had to fork the get random library and then manually hook in uh, SP1's source of randomness. The next thing that we had to change, and also along the vein of non-determinism, is threading and file system access. When you have multiple threads, obviously, when you're executing over the same inputs, you could have different outputs, depending on how those threads are scheduled. And Agave has at least seven threads. There is, uh, I think, four threads for non-vote transactions, two threads for vote transactions, and then that one central scheduling thread, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. And then there's a bunch of other background processes as well. And uh, there's also file system access to pull data, write data, so on and so forth. And so this caused issues in the ZKVM as well. A ZKVM, um, specifically succinct, but I think it applies to all uh, general purpose ZKVMs, they can only be single-threaded. So there can only be one set of execution at a time, and file system access is completely disabled. So what we did was to run Agave's SVM crate as a single execution thread without all the background processes and other file system IO. Um, this works in the uh, proving case because we don't have the same performance requirements as a live consensus network. So we don't need to have the same caching and threading in place. This simplification actually allowed us to have more streamlined code, a faster development process, iteration process, and also smaller ZKPs, ZK proofs that were generated. All right. And then the key change that we had to make was to account for bit depth issues. So if you're familiar with ZKVMs, general purpose ZKVMs, um, you would know they're, most of them are based on a RISC-V um, instruction set, and they're 32 bits. However, Agave's uh, eBPF interpreter, uh, the VM, operates in uh, 64 bits. And it typically runs on 64-bit machines, like most validators. I think all validators actually uh, run on 64-bit machines. And so when you run it in a 32-bit environment, that's pretty much untested. And so we quickly ran into memory access issues with in invalid memory accesses. Um, on the left, I have the ideal case or the typical case. You have the BPF VM operating in 64 bits. You have 64 
64-bit addresses that map to 64-bit pointers on the host machine. And everything is well, because everything is compatible. Everything is 64 bits. However, in our ZK case, we have the same BPF VM, but we have a different host machine that's 32 bits. So you can see the mapping isn't quite compatible. and. Uh, addresses are truncated. So you're instead of pointing here, you're pointing to some random place in memory, and things don't quite work the way you want them to. What we did is uh, actually uh, create new structs or classes in our fork of Agave to account for this discrepancy. So we created. Uh, a newer version of account info of slice and also of a slice of slices, I believe. Um, and then uh, we use these class, these classes or structs in substitution of the original ones so that the, the case on the right um, is in fact compatible. Diving a bit deeper into what these structs look like under the hood, they consist of 16 bytes. So uh, eight bytes is for one U64 pointer. And another eight bytes is for the U64 length to match the 64-bit implementation of a slice in Rust. So this was how we uh, accounted for the bit depth or memory issues um, to make sure that it explicitly works for the 32-bit case. And we've actually upstreamed these changes to Anza's version of Agave. So this should be available for anyone to use if they, if they want to prove, if they want to run Agave in a ZKVM or run Agave in, in a 32-bit environment for any other reason. With those changes in place, we were able to do some benchmarks on how expensive, how expensive it is to prove uh, SVM transactions. So when we first published this work back in December of last year, about five months ago, uh, we were using a benchmark set of 100 SPL transactions. So each of these transactions were packed um, pretty full. So they're pretty beefy transactions. One transaction consisted of eight instructions to um, create a mint account for a token, to actually mint that token to Alice's uh, ATA associate token account, um, transfer tokens from Alice, her ATA to Bob's ATA, and then burn the token, and then close the token account. So it's, it's the whole full process in just one SPL transaction. And we were running 100, 100 of these for our benchmarks. So back in December, you can see uh, how expensive the proofs were in terms of both time and cost. So for time, this was 2,300 seconds, or a little bit under 40 minutes to prove 100 transactions. And in terms of cost as well, it was about $5, $5.32. Since then, we've done some optimiz optimization work to make it a lot cheaper. One of the key things we did was to reduce the cycle count from 7 billion to 3 billion. Uh, and this was removing some of the overhead setup from each transaction into just one setup at the beginning of the setup benchmarks. So instead of doing um, this setup 100 times for each transaction, we, we would just do it once. So this reduced some of the computational complexity and the cycle count. And so our most recent set of benchmarks from last month in April, you can see is a lot better and a lot more usable. So for time, uh, it's about 240 seconds, so about four or five minutes. And then in terms of cost as well, it's 80 to 90 cents. So it's a lot more usable for proving, doing continuous proving of Solana transactions, Solana blocks, and also for use cases outside of rollups as well. Cool. And then I mentioned earlier that we've upstreamed these changes. And I've linked the PRs here if you want to take a look. Um, the first two change sets have been reviewed, merged, and checked in. So they're already part of upstream agave. The third pull request is still going through the review process. But we hope to get that checked in soon. So this entire 
uh, uh, bit depth issue is not going to be a problem any, anymore for other folks trying to run Agave inside a 32-bit machine or you know, for whatever other reason. Um, once these, check, when the, once these changes are all checked in, then that's available. However, if you are operating in a um, deterministic environment, you will need to pull in the randomness, time, and file system access yourself, because obviously we can't upstream those changes to Agave. Cool. And then lastly, I want to give a shout out to some of our collaborators for this work. Uh, I want to thank uh, Alessandro, Alexander, and Joe from the Anza team for their support throughout this process and for reviewing our pull requests. And I also want to thank Uma and her team at Succinct for helping us uh, with some of the randomness issues and some of the SP1, getting that to work with Agave. Lastly, if uh, you're interested in this work, if you're interested in this work, feel free to message me on Telegram or Twitter. I'm at Oceanic Ursula if you want to chat. Cool. This is the the end of my talk. Um, thank you guys so much, and hope everyone has a great rest of the week. Yeah.